Hello and welcome to the most illustrious book awards of the year. It is in fact the 2020 Cookie Awards. If you weren't here last year, we did the Cookie Awards to celebrate me, Lauren Cook, having done some reading. And what we actually found was that I am borderline illiterate. So let's see if that pattern has continued. This is not your average award show some categories um the less said the better okay so last year um as my cookie i gave an actual cookie i as the award i gave a biscuit that i'd bitten i don't have any biscuits with me this year um so maybe we're gonna have to revert back to this sad half leaked panda snow globe um I think it leaked in the aeroplane when we were bringing it back from holiday. <laughs> so it's, the water is somewhere over the Atlantic like six years ago. Whoa. Oh god, 10 years ago? 13 years ago? Who knows? What I'm going to do is I'm going to shake it up and record a single clip of me presenting it. And we're going to reuse that clip. Where are my lesbians? Time to talk about the lesbians of 2020. First of all, let's just... So many, so many excellent lesbians I discovered in 2020. Not least because I started reading Sarah Waters. And when we're thinking about the Sarah Waters books, you know, I read Tip in the Velvet with two of the most iconic lesbians ever in the form of Kitty Butler and Nan King. Um, however, we're not going to give it to either of them. We're also not going to give it to the incredible left-wing socialist dyke that Nan ends up with. No, we're going to skip over, skip over Tip in the Velvet. However, A 30 by Sarah Waters. Can we hear it for a lesbian psychic con woman in prison who seduces a visitor and sends her absolutely mad with the yearning? Uh, honestly, she went there, she did that. She didn't have to go that hard, but she absolutely did. Let's give it up for Selena Dawes, ladies and gentlemen. Selena Dawes, lesbian of the year. Okay, let's have a think about gayest book of the year. You might be like, Lauren, you've already talked about your lesbians of the year. How can you have a queerer book? A queer book that doesn't have your favourite lesbians in? What's going on? Queer book of the year is... The Adventures of China Iron by Gabriela Cabazon Camara, translated by these lovely ladies. And this is queer, not sapphic or lesbian, because who knows what is going on with these ladies labeling their sexualities, because it's fucking wild. Um, we have genderqueer characters, we have non-binary characters, it's just a lot of free love going on a lot of spicy things happening with a lot of people best reading advancement of the year don't really know how to phrase this one finally 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 finding a viable alternative to goodreads because amazon is evil and unless you are extorting them through audible you should not be doing business with them however you know there's a whole class debate about that um and if that's what you can afford, go for it. If you're in a position where you can boycott Amazon, boycott Amazon. Um, I'm kind of between those two brackets. <laughs> we try our best. I boycott Amazon for buying books. But I'm really glad that I don't have to support them through this other channel of Goodreads. Because Goodreads was ugly. It wasn't fit for purpose. They never put any money into updating it and keeping it relevant and useful as a tool for readers. It was oversaturated. Kind of like a popularity contest. People would rate books especially on the end of your reading poll thing uh, that they'd never actually read and it just wasn't really a useful tool for readers it was a useful tool for stanning and i completely appreciate that like if that's what you want to do with books go ahead stan on goodreads please do not bring that to the story graph the story graph i am enamored i'm so happy that as well as being run and owned by a lady of color it is a really useful tool it's gaining some traction it's got some people using it not as many people as i would like to have seen at this point 
I don't want this to be a flash in the pan like Buckley or Booksloth or any of those other alternatives that appeared and then vanished. But I am really enjoying my time using Storygraph and I just hope it stays around for us. I think it's a massive, massive step for readers. And obviously as we've been in a pandemic, independent bookshops have really been struggling this year. So I would like to give a cookie to all of the independent bookshops I visited and enjoyed this year, really. But like maybe we'll find one that speaks to us the most. So um, in Edinburgh, I visited Typewronger Bookshop. I visited Golden Hair Books, Lighthouse Bookshop, um, Toppings and Company. And in London, I visited Guess the Word, Daunt. And all of these bookshops have been beautiful experiences. And I would much rather give them my money than Waterstones, especially Amazon. So I have to say that my heart lies with Gears the Word as my favourite independent bookshop this year. The people in the queues outside, we've just been chilling, chatting, having a good time, uh, being real gay. It is such a safe space. I have seen young kids go there with their family members and be able to totally be themselves. The staff there are so kind, so patient, so helpful. They didn't kick us out when Jesse started coughing, <laughs> even though <laughs> everyone assumed they had COVID. They didn't. They just drank some water and it went the wrong way. But still, it's such a community feel at that shop. And I want to be one of the regulars. Like, I want to be a person that the owner recognises because I'm obsessed with him. <laughs> Liminal space of the year. Yes, we're doing this. This is a new category. I, without a shadow of a... I am going to give this to... The Grace Keepers by Kirsty Logan because you might be like Lauren and they travel hundreds and hundreds of miles in that book like they're in forests they're on the sea they're on boats they're on islands um everywhere they go <laughs> becomes a liminal space and I'll tell you for why the atmosphere of this book is so whimsical so just just out of joint with reality that you're never settled in that story you are always aware that something unusual is happening it's not our world but it's even unusual within their world. There are monsters that can't quite be. There are transformations. There is a circus, which to me is one of the most liminal spaces. Um, but then you take it from a very rooted idea of a circus in our society and you put it on water. Terrible things have happened in the forest to some of these characters and they are trying to escape, but they are still within their own mindsets. And it all just adds up to this again disjointed kind of mildly uncomfortable existence and this feeling of being watched throughout and it was just haunting and beautiful and i don't think i'm ever going to read anything quite like it again the book i am most proud of myself for having read this year the master and the margarita i read yes thank you thank you i did actually read one of my Russian vintage classics. Unfortunately, it was the one that I've only worn for a year instead of four years, like the rest of them. But the fact that I have conquered something in that series, oh, oh my, oh. I honestly, how could I be any more iconic than I am? Okay, so in terms of best of, I read a lot of really, really good books this year. Like it has been a phenomenal reading year for me. So I was thinking I would give some best of genre categories, uh, purely because, and I know, I know what my best book of the year was. Um, so let's just, let's just go through it. <laughs> my sci-fi book of the year, there was actually a bit of a contest for this one. Um, you know, there was, there was a lot of really good books I read in sci-fi this year. And the best book in sci-fi I read was The Crack and Wakes by John Wyndham, Early Cli-Fi, Global Warming but Caused by Aliens, Cozy Catastrophe, A Man and His Wife, Pottering About in a Little Motorboat, London Being Turned Into a Swamp. Just incredible, honestly incredible. Uh, and to read that kind of a couple of weeks before the pandemic took hold, on a tube, on a commute, surrounded by people, being like, yeah, none of you bitches would survive. If there was some kind of disaster that happened, only I would survive. <laughs> Best non-fiction I read. This is a smaller category than it normally is for me, 
but this year I read The Five by Harry Rubenfeld. Like, how, how can four pages of an introduction of a book completely change your entire perspective on one of the most famous narratives in British history? Hallie, how? Te teach me. And she did. She taught me. Uh, incredible, flawless. It follows the lives of the five canonical victims of Jack the Ripper, all their last recorded movements using every historical source she can get her hands on, and, you know, a little bit of conjecture, but the conjecture is based on social fact of the time. So it's not like she's just made it up. <laughs> it's like valid and it's realistic. Um, and the story stops before they meet him and he is never mentioned as part of their narratives. And at the end of the book afterwards, what what I think we're going to give another award, most heartbreaking thing I've read this year, thing that made me actually cry this year. Um, she lists in the back of the book... Um, the items that were found on the bodies of the women and it was kind of what these women who had gone through massive inequality massive struggles had come out the other side owning on their death um everything that they possessed <sighs> and it was really powerful and you'd built up such a connection to these women's lives and seen them as such real people rather than just the five chronicle victims quite often they don't even get given their names they are just the five chronicle victims of jack the ripper um and to know their stories to know their struggles and to see kind of what the world had left them with at the end no it it, it was heartbreaking um <clears throat> double award there killed the mood but <laughs> double award Next up, we are going to discuss novellas. Yes, we are. We're going to discuss novellas. Um, I read two novellas this year, both sci-fi novellas. So again, which category do they fall under? Um, they were both phenomenal. Like any other year, these could have been my best sci-fi book. Never mind, like my best sci-fi novella. Um, they were to be taught. If fortunate, by Becky Chambers incredible and this is how we win the time war by two authors uh best means of the year ladies and gentlemen <laughs> no no um both very queer books both very much dealing with aspects of sci-fi that i love kind of lost in space and lost through time uh, I have to give it to this is how you lose the time war because of the level it's influenced me to kind of on other writing projects I thought I could go back and be like oh it's given me a new way to think about writing sci-fi and also projects going forwards it's massively influenced um, to the point where they'll have to go in the acknowledgements I think <laughs> absolutely one of the best things I've ever read again had me crying on the tube you cannot show emotion in that little metal canister that hurtles you through the centre of London. I was crying. Not because something sad was happening, just because the writing itself was so beautiful and the yearning <laughs> was so intense that it actually had me crying on the tube. So take it. Take that plot it. Best translated book of the year, honestly. I've had such an amazing year in translation. Um, obviously, I'm very pleased that I read The Master and the Margarita by Michael Bergashov. And I just, I don't think it was my favourite. I loved it, but it also felt like if I didn't finish it, I was going to go mental at myself. So, like, there was loads of pressure. Mm. The Housekeeper and the Professor by Yoko Ogawa, translated by Stephen Schneider. Beautiful book. Honestly one of the most profound soothing reading experiences i have ever had however i think purely for the length of time it was on my tbr the relief of finishing it and the solitude of the writing i'm going to give best translated book to 
Roy Jacobson's The Unseen, translated by Don Bartlett and Don Shaw. It is just a really quiet story set on a Norwegian island about a couple of generations of a family and the drama they have and kind of the births, the deaths, the adoptions, the horses they kill, the farming that goes on, the invention, the innovation, how people kind of scrape a living in these really extreme climates and how they live well. I don't really know what else there is to say about that, but again, a body of water that comes to represent something it is not. It is a theme that I love in writing. Best book to movie adaptation. This is not the best book that was adapted in the best movie this year. It's not even the best book to movie adaptation that I've never seen before. This is the one I enjoyed the most. And guess what? It's the same as every other year. It's 2005 Pride and Prejudice. The Yearning. Honestly, this year I have been gay. Like, The Yearning is all I've cared about. Films, TV, music. If it does not evoke the yearn, I don't quite understand what I'm doing there. So yet again, Pride and Prejudice has taken the crown. However, best adaptation that makes me want to read the book goes to Queen's Gambit. That I was not expecting to enjoy because it's about chess and I thought it was going to be a bit like... I'm not like the other girls. I can play chess. <laughs> uh, and you know what? It kind of was a little bit, but I really enjoyed it. It was really compelling. It was a little bit sexy. There was like a frisson of queerness in the short story of the year. I wasn't going to do because I haven't read a huge amount. But I would like to talk about The Breakthrough, which I read and really enjoyed. Uh, it was a short story by uh, uh, Daphne du Maurier, yes that was it, which I kind of found very odd because in my mind Daphne du Maurier writes kind of gothic turn of the century pieces uh, and she was actually writing kind of like a 1930s research base, you know like a military installation and I enjoyed it. At first I was a bit annoyed at quite how obviously she was pulling on Greek mythology. Um, I just have a really bad reaction to kind of Greek mythology and things because to me it's quite a classist issue. The fact that I don't understand Greek myth, I just don't know Greek mythology. Um, and as soon as I see someone with it out, I'm like, this explains to me a lot about how you were brought up and how you were schooled. Um, but I love Greek mythology. How mad is it? Like I love Percy Jackson, which I discovered this year. I love reading the Greek myths. I just can't retain them. And to me, someone who has kind of like had them drilled in them through a schooling system is a tarring. So yeah, I do not react well to retellings and and like little nods to Greek mythology as if you should just understand. You should just understand because we all do this at school. We don't. We do not. I was busy trying not to get knifed at school. So, but you know, it was quite a compelling little story. I enjoyed my time with it in the end. I understood why the Greek mythology references were there. It was Kenny. It was in one of those little blue classics that Jesse bought me towards the end of the year, which was very kind. Are we doing audio book of the year? Audio book of the year I'm going to give to The Milkman by Anna Burns because I thought I would hate that book. Stream of Consciousness, Irish author, after James Joyce, I never thought I would do either of those things ever again. Uh, but I did, and you know what? I loved it. With such subtlety and kind of intention, this world of Ireland was crafted, and kind of the political tension was there, but it was also just a backdrop to everyday life. It was kind of like something that happened. Um, and to an outsider's perspective, you kind of can't imagine people living normal lives in amongst all of that violence. That was being inflicted on that community. Also, you had very human stories, kind of, kind of how a community doesn't recognise sexual assault until it's physical, how violence has to be physical in that kind of environment for it to be real, and when you're so desensitised to fear, how your fear of men can affect you. And honestly, just beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And I've been inspired by that. In writing a short story for competitions hopefully we'll see how well that does me series of the year series of the year that's what we can do 
So I read one, two series in their entirety this year. I finished a different series that I'd started last year and I've started a couple of series as well. So I don't really know how it's fair to judge this because I love the Percy Jackson series. I love the fact that it was written for children with ADHD as well as representing children with ADHD. It was short, it was snappy, it was action all the way through. It would really keep some of the kids I work with very engaged, which is a massive ask of them. And also of the books that disable them usually. Um, so I am very, very happy and at peace to have found Percy Jackson. However, if I'm going to pick between the two series I started and finished this year, I would have to give it to the Ark of the Side series by Neil Shusterman. However, I still think my overall reading experience of the Shades of Magic series was a little bit superior. I think they both did very different things in very different ways. However, the Schwab, she crafted more of a world for me. And I know Neil Schusterman's world was very close to our own intentionally, but I love getting lost in a world and Thee Schwab did that. The most disappointing book I read in 2020 was without a shadow of a doubt, Everything Under by Daisy Johnson. Um, I made a whole video about how I feel like this trans representation was shit and harmful. Uh, and just kind of like, everything I hated about it, the language, the tone, the representation, liminal spaces, class issues, kind of anything that normally would be like, Lauren is here for it, was done poorly. Was it the worst book of the year? It was certainly the most disappointing book of the year. I don't feel like I'm fully reaching the level I was at in that video. Um, <laughs> so maybe I'll put a little clip in here. Hey, shortlisted for the Booker Prize for the debut novel. Hey, Daisy Johnson had it all. She had it all. It is desperate to be literary fiction. But the suspense of the absolute tragedy porn is once we found her, she continually tries to kill herself. And oh, will it work this time? There are all these disparate threads that at some point you were willing to weave together into something more impressive. Twisted away from you at the very last minute with all the pizzazz of particularly underwhelming Victorian parlour trick. You aren't hinting one thing while laying the road for the other. You're beating us senseless, blindfolding us, putting us in the boot, and then pulling a Yui on a dual carriageway. Not being funny, if my next door neighbour put out any sort of prophecy, I'd be like, all right, Stuart, time to lay off the Merlot. Even if he started spouting Macbeth-level portents of doom, even if he put on a wig and called himself Agnes Nutter, I'd be like, Oof, son, that's enough garden parties for you. What I wouldn't do is pack a little suitcase and run away from home at the age of 15. At the age of 15, I'd be straight on the group chat telling all my mates about my fucking psycho wino neighbour. It uses these really juvenile cliffhangers and that's coming from someone who teaches narrative therapy to year eights with developmental language disorder. Let me tell you, no one is transgender because they think it will make them safer. Over 80% of transgender people have thought about committing suicide over 40% have tried. Hate crimes are increasing year on year online and in real life. The average life expectancy of a trans person in the UK is 35 years old. Does this still sound like a quirky little detail you can add to a character with zero explanation of their identity or exploration of it? Does this seem still like a clever little hook to wrap your flimsy idea of a retelling around? Let's make the transition so questionable that in everyone's mind this is still a 15 year old girl talking her own mum. I've had time, I've had space, I've mellowed. Now I'm sure we are all really waiting for this next one, best book of the year. Ladies and gentlemen, best book of the year. We had some strong contenders from across the genres, however this was always an ill-fated category because I knew the first book I read of this year, this decade, would be best book. Uh, and you know what? I was right. <laughs> Literally pan off the rest of the year. Those other 99 books, gone. <laughs> Needn't have bothered. Book of the year is Erin Morgenstern's The Starless Sea. It is low-key queer. It is vibey, it is cosy, it's got mystery, deceit, it's got 
bees. It's got that thing that I love of like liminal spaces that include water, like water that is not always H2O water. A body of liquid. That's all it takes to get me to love a book.